Well, how's everybody this morning? Did you have a good week? Best that you can't have anyway? It's a quiet crowd now. You anticipating a good day today? All right, now, now we're kind of getting into the mood of things. Well, I won't take up any more time. I'll go ahead and let the announcements begin. Good morning. You know, we, all ha we have all types of missions here at Calvary, like local, state, and international. And this month, we have an international mission and two local that we are supporting. Our international is the shoebox ministry, which is Operation Christmas Child. And right now, we're collecting small stuffed animals and small toys. And we just have one more Sunday to bring these particular items. And our collection box is back there in the fellowship hall, if you would like to help with that. <coughs> Um, one of our local missions is turning bare feet into learning feet, and we're collecting new shoes for school children that are in the Franklin County school system. So the box is located in the Fellowship Hall. We need both boys' and girls' tennis shoes, and you can look in the box and kind of see which sizes have been brought so far, and then you can purchase a size that we have not gotten yet. Uh, our baby bottle blessings is now into full swing, and the baby bottles are located back there in the crate. If you haven't picked one up yet, then please do take one for our family, and you can fill it up with coins, cash, or a check made out to the church and put the baby bottle blessings in the memo line. Now, you can wait to bring your full bottle back on Father's Day, which I think, yeah, June 16th. Uh, but if you want to bring it back before then, are we putting them over here? We're put, set it on the communion table, and our treasurer will take care of it. Um, just do not place it back in the crate because we'll get it mixed up where you might miss it. Um, there's an updated list of our greeters and ushers and scripture readers that's on the podium at the back of the sanctuary if you need to pick one of those up, and we thank you everyone that participates in that. And also there's a basket in the foyer area, so if you're participating and sending out cards through the card ministry, please bring back the Ziploc bag and place it there in the foyer afterwards. Um, we have a deacons meeting on Tuesday night, May 21st at 6 p.m. here at the church. Then on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, I've got it the second thing business meeting and this is on wednesday night may 22nd that's this wednesday at 6 30 p.m um, and then the picnic at the wilson's that's this coming saturday may the 25th at 2 p.m and if you wish to attend the picnic this coming saturday you need to sign up and state what dish you are bringing because that'll be it today and just remember to bring your chair with you Good morning. Good morning. Just how precious is the Lord to us? Think about what he's done for you. Think about what the difference he has made in your life. Think about your salvation and your eternal life. The songwriter says that he is indeed more precious than silver and more costly than gold. You'll find those words in your bulletin. Can we stand together and begin our time of worship by expressing to God how precious he is to us? <laughs> Because you are just that precious to us. And we ask, Lord, that you would 
would guide our worship that we may truly communicate with you that we may hear and understand. Because of who you are, we are here, and we cling to the promise that you have made that while we are gathered here in your name, that you are among us, and we are blessed just by that. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you have a seat? And as you do, let's turn together in the hymn to him number 273. 273. <laughs> church. Good morning. I was strolling through the Facebook and I seen a little thing on there that says six reasons why you should trust God. One, he knows he knows you by name. Isaiah 43 1. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob and he that formed thee. O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Number two, he will fight for you. Exodus 4.14, the Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Number three, he thinks about you. Psalms 139.17, how precious also are they are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. He has peace for you, plans for you. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward thee, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an unexpected expected end. Number five, he is your refuge. Psalm 62, 6 and 8. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. 
Number six, he is always with you. Matthew 18, 20 tells us, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. I looked over this list, and I thought, you know what? They left out the most important one. It's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I know that I don't sing, but I can read. <laughs> and I have this song I brought to play for you, but I'm going to read the words to you so you won't miss it. Our church has been through a lot of sadness this year, I guess. And this song really spoke to my heart. And it says, Jesus loves you. When you feel forgotten, when you feel you're all alone, when you feel like giving up, when you feel discouraged and everything's uncertain, when you feel you're just not good enough, when it's slipping through your hands and you've done all you can and there's still so much more to do, it's easy to forget in times like this. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you and he cares about everything you're going through. Your name is engraved on the palm of his hand, and that's a promise you can hold on to. It's easy to forget in time like this. Jesus loves you. When a funeral is over, the casseroles are gone, and you're about as broken as can be. When the sun ain't shining, the nights are just too long, and the weight of it all drives you to your knees. I've been there where you are when God just seemed so far, and I needed to be reminded to, easy, it's easy to forget in times like this. Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. Okay. Thank you, Joan, and thank you, Sherry. Easter, right, is that who that was? Okay. Find the hymn book again. Can we stand together as we sing Grace Greater Than Our Sin? 329 is where you'll find it. 329. <laughs>
Brother Tom, would you ask God to bless our offering? to our time of sermonizing, I'd like to ask Kennedy if you would come up here. It's good to see you today. She is very successful. She does everything she sets her mind to, mind to and you're graduating, or already have. I already have. When was your graduation day? April 27th. April 27th. If you don't care, tell us a little bit about what you have planned next. So in July, I'm going to Puerto Rico for a mission trip for with my soccer team so this will be my fifth season at Asbury so and then for my mission trip we'll be hosting soccer camps for the little kids in the village that we're going to be working in and just really pour into them and just show them that like we live for a mighty God and that Amen. we will never give up so that is our mission there, so. Amen. Amen. We have a little gift from the church to you. This is the second time since I've been here yeah. that you've graduated. and so. But you're going to go on in school, correct? Yeah, I'll be doing my master's in the fall at Asbury. So. Okay. I think she really likes getting these graduation Sundays. So <laughs> she's a professional student. Yeah. Amen. Amen. How wonderful. Plus, you got to spend some time at Disney yeah. and uh, had a great time down there. And so, well, we're, we're so proud of you. Congratulations. Miss Sharon. Mm. <laughs> I thought to myself, Joan must have had a better surgeon. She went up one at a time. <laughs> I have to. Anyway. Just a little over five years ago, my sister called me, Linda, and she said, I just need to talk to somebody. I said, okay. She said, I've just found the resume of a gentleman that had gotten clipped together with another resume that we were looking at on the search committee. And she said, I don't know what to do. But she said, when I held it in my hand, something said, this one's different. And I said, well, that should be a pretty good sign. And I said, have you talked to the committee about it? And she said, no, I think you all were meeting that night maybe. And I said, well, just tell them how you feel. And she said, there's just something special about this resume and I can't quite put my finger on it. And 
And so she asked me if I would pray with her, and I did. And they had their meeting, and they talked about it and everything. And I called, and I said, well, how'd your meeting go? She said, I believe we found the one. Hmm. And I said, which one? And she said, the one that was clipped to the wrong resume. Amen. I said, why'd you have to find No. Right, yeah. <laughs> so they met with Rusty and Susan shortly after that, mm -hmm. I believe. It was a whirlwind. And Linda called me that night after that, and she said, he is phenomenal, and so is his wife. And I said, well, you can't beat that. So, uh, Susan, you want to join us? Because, you know, um, he can't do this without you. Amen. And because God, I truly believe that God called you both. And Susan's going, oh, no, he didn't go. I got used to it now. <laughs> <laughs> but we are so blessed to welcome uh, Rusty and Susan on their fifth year anniversary. We hope we have lots and lots of Oh, well, thank years. you. Yes, yes. As I was telling the Sunday school class this morning, you'll see it in that thing I gave you. We've had 21 pastors here at Calvary, but the first group of pastors were those that came from the seminary in Louisville that were studying and training to, to uh, come to the pulpit. So the longest tenure we've had is 12 years, so you've got to beat it. That's right. <laughs> 20, 30, whatever. Exactly. Right. As long as the Lord gives me. Okay. Is there anybody that would like to say anything to Brother Rusty and Susan? Except hallelujah. Yeah. Speech. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're God welcome. bless you. You're welcome. Can I say something? Yes. Sure. Go ahead. There's a hand up over here. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you. There's a hand it's over here, Robin. It's a joy to be here. Um, when you first start in a pastorate, you don't know everybody, um, but you don't realize how much you're going to love them in just a short amount of time. And so when I look over the crowd, I just want you to know how much love I have in my heart for you. Um, I'm always so happy when Nancy's here because she's smiling. Some <laughs> of you guys need to take some lessons on that and put your <laughs> smilers on. Um, but I do love you, and I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Amen. Robin, do you have something? Amen. Amen. Thank you. For those Thank of y'all that, that don't know, uh, they were here, what, about nine months before COVID hit? Yes. And these pews were empty for a good while, but guess who kept on preaching? Brother Rusty came to us from his home, um, and we could sit in our pajamas with our coffee <laughs> and listen to the sermon, and that was... So oh, how we missed days of COVID. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, the good thing is, uh, Rusty has agreed that if we're ever in inclement weather that we cannot be here, he'll preach from home, so tune him in. Always, always. Yes. Thank you, Ron. Susan. Now, you all go have a good time. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. It has been a whirlwind with COVID in the middle of it. Uh, me and Brother Tom were just sharing a minute ago, this was something that all pastors alike, whether they were new in the ministry or been in the ministry a long time, dealt with the pandemic. Um, and what do you do? I mean, just what do you do? So we just did the best we could, and the Lord blessed. Amen? Amen. Keep preaching the Word in season and out of season, as the Scripture says. Well, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. I told David that I was going to take my text from 21 through 23, but my intention is to finish Matthew chapter 7 today. How many of you just looked at your clock? <laughs> this should be brief. It may be hard. It may be um, like facing a fastball or, or the um, knuckleballs of times past because this is one of the, the hardest things I think Jesus says that a lot of people struggle with today. And there's a lot of different ways maybe to consider what he said, but the obvious of what he said, um, he's dealing with people who have a head knowledge but not a heart knowledge. 
people that may know about Christ but don't know him personally. And so this is how he winds up his sermon. So if you'll consider what we've looked at so far in the Sermon on the Mount and how Jesus has said over and over again, you have heard it said, but I say, there to be attitudes. We saw all that. He's comparing the religiosity, if you will, of the day versus his intent and what his actual kingdom looks like. Now, his kingdom is not religious. It's a relationship. I know you've seen it on T-shirts and bumper stickers and things like that, but, but keep that in mind that in the day that Jesus preached this sermon, religion was the go-to. That's why he said so many things that were absolute gut punches to the Pharisees and the scribes, you see, because they were more concerned, as we've said a thousand times, with the outside of the cup. They were more concerned with how they appeared versus how they were on the inside. And Jesus actually said, you know, you, you're, you're whitewashed sepulchers. You're beautiful from the outside, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. And, and so Jesus made a point of coming against the religion, the rule-oriented, the rule oriented, not love-oriented religion of the day. And so he's been preaching this sermon. And in this last section, we've talked about uh, the two paths, the two gates, the two destinations, the two trees. We've looked at that. And he kind of winds this up with an appeal to do the will of the Father. And this is a very complicated set of verses. So if you would, in, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21... And we'll read through um, the close of the chapter. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and it beat upon the house and it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and the beat against the house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For his teaching, he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the years that you've given us, Father. Thank you for the, the milestones that we've seen in, in people's lives. And Father, we also thank you for those that came before us. Father, those that are no longer with us, but were a part of this work here at Calvary. Lord, we thank you that we today, sitting in this congregation, are a part of a long history and tradition of preaching the word and serving you. Father, I pray that you will enlighten us today, that we may see from you and hear from you on the things that you would have for us to do, to practice, maybe the things we are to quit in the name of Jesus, our risen Savior. And Lord, we come to you in your name and in your name only. Amen. So pretty tough, right? Pretty tough. Many are going to come to me and say, there's a few things I want to kind of highlight. Can you imagine how the Pharisees took what he said there? Listen to what he said. Um, I've got the wrong chapter now. Hang on, let me flip. There we go. I look down and I'm like, I don't know those verses. Listen to what he says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. Think about the arrogancy in what he said if he's not God. If he's not the judge of all creation. Think about the arrogancy and how the Pharisees and the scribes would have heard that. He says on that day, guess what? The, the Hebrew people around him fully understood he's talking about judgment day. He's talking about the day when God was going to judge the living and the dead. That's what they expected, a great judgment day. Now, they had no idea about eschatology as we know it today, about the seven churches of Revelation and the, the dispensationalism and the, the amillennialism and the postmillennialism and the mid-trib rapture. He, he, they had no idea about any of that, and God doesn't either. When he figures out those charts, he's coming back. Because those charts are confusing, Amen. And I got news for you. Every single one of them is wrong. You know why? Because at some point, every single one of them disagrees with what the Scripture plainly says. But it's man's best attempt at understanding the simple fact Jesus is coming back. 
And you either receive him as Lord now, or you'll meet him as judge then. Now think about that. Isn't that just the simplest thing? You'll receive him as Lord now, or you'll meet him as judge then. And the Bible doesn't give us any room for any, any um, late over when it's all said and done. Now let's, let's try again. Let me, let me see if I can get that right. And, and that's exactly what Jesus explains here. Listen to what he says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Now that word Lord, we read that and we read it in Scripture and we go, you know what? They were calling him Lord, like master of the universe. Not necessarily. See, in that day, the, the Greek word kurios just simply means Lord, like master, leader, somebody who has authority, somebody who has power. Um, somebody could be the Lord of the household. It's the same word. You couldn't really tell the difference. Now, we can tell uh, theologically by context when we're referring to him as Lord of the universe or they're referring to Lord as in he's over top of all the crops or all, all the things that are done in this household, Lord of the house. It's interesting. The, if we get into the Old Testament, I can't remember the original language, but the word Baal, have you heard of Baal or Baal? You know what that word means? Lord. It means the same thing, just a different language. I don't, I don't remember if it's Canaanite or Ugaritic or what it is because I lose all those things because they don't really matter that much. But, but we see that word a lot, and, and we read it, and it just it means if we can't lose the fact that Lord means Lord, Master. But when Jesus is referring to himself here in that day, many are going to say to me. Now remember, he's a man standing there, and they really can't tell the difference necessarily right off the bat other than the close of the whole chapter that says he taught with authority. Did he have authority? He has all authority. Remember what he said at the end of the book, all authority, all power is given to me under heaven and earth, right? All power has been given to him. And so he knew who he was, yet he preached to them as though they had a choice and a chance to, to live up to some of the things that he was preaching. So when he says all this, we've got to go back and kind of look at everything he said in this sermon. Because I know it's been 15, 19, 30, however, 60 weeks it may feel like to you. I don't know that we've been in this, in this Sermon on the Mount. Remember, this is the same moment. This is the same preaching. This is the same context when he first started with the Sermon on the Mount. It's just taken me forever to go through here and point out some things that we need to know. So at the end of a sermon, when you hear the closing line, and, and he's wrapping it up, he's not talking about what he said last week. He's not referencing anything he said next week. He's not referring to all these other things. He's referring to what he had just presented in that sermon, and he's, he's going for a reaction. So keep that in mind when you read that. And listen to what he says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's pretty stark, isn't it? I mean, we got people that are calling him Lord. We got people that are recognizing he's the master of something. We got people that are wrecking. But not only, listen to what it says. Uh, he says, but the one who does the will of my Father. Well, what's the will of the Father? Well, if you'll, you'll go look in John chapter 6, verse 40. I've got it right here. Let me read it for you. John 6, 40. Um, another book. I realize that. Jesus says, for this is the will of the Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. This is the will of the Father. And I will raise him up on the last day. I will raise him up on that day. See, they had an understanding about that day, that day of judgment, the, the great resurrection as they saw it. Even Martha understood that when Jesus went to Lazarus, went to the tomb, and she said, you, you know, he's going he's to live again. She said, well, I know, in the resurrection. But if you'd only been here earlier, he never would have died. That's when Jesus says, I am the life, Right? He is the life. He is the eternal life. And so Jesus is saying to them here, among the Pharisees and the scribes, who cared more about what it looked like than what was going on here. Jesus is getting to the point of everything that he said. And if you'll go back and you'll read these chapters, um, you may say, I'm having trouble keeping some of these. Listen to what he says. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, how many of us have just a little bit of ego when we struggle with poor in spirit, right? Blessed are those who mourn. Don't we struggle with that? The meek. We live in a world that says, no, be loud and be proud, right? And Jesus says, blessed are the meek. 
Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Boy, it's hard to show mercy sometimes. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted. How many of you are looking forward to that one? Oh, persecution. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing me with persecution. Can you imagine? So let me go back through the Sermon on the Mount. He talked about being salt and light in the earth. In other words, the way you conduct yourself should have an effect on the people that are around you. You should be light in a dark situation. You should be salt in a rancid situation. Or you should bring flavor to a bland situation. That's what, that's what he's saying. This is what it's going to look like in his kingdom. This is what it looks like when Jesus is your Lord. And he goes on and he, he, he said, I... I, do you think that I've come to abolish the law? No, I'm here to fulfill the entirety of the law. Well, the law was a burden on them, just trying to keep that and to live up to that. And, and Jesus said, I'm here to fulfill it. And then he says, don't be angry. If you're angry, you're committing murder in your heart. And he said, don't look at a woman lustfully because you're committing adultery in your heart. And, and, and all these things, and, and, and he talks about divorce. He talks about oaths. He talks about retaliation. He talks about loving your enemies. It's crazy, giving to the needy. Then he gives us the Lord's Prayer. He talks about fasting. All these things that Jesus had just talked about, all part of the same conclusion. This is what it looks like. You have heard it said, but I say. It's different, isn't it? Walking with Christ is different. So see what, what he's saying is there's going to become people come to me on that day when it's all over with. I'm the judge of all things. So first thing is their mind is blown. Who do you think you are? I mean, we're going to come to you on judgment day. We're going to stand before you. You see what he's proclaiming there? He's the judge of the world. He's letting them know of his exaltation, which we know looking back, but they had no idea. And I'm sure that caught a few of them off guard. They were pearl clutching. You know what I mean? What? What? What's he talking about? And Jesus says, on that day, you're going to stand before me. He says, not everybody that calls out to me, Lord, Lord. I, I like the inference on that, Lord, Lord. I, I can see it this way in today's modern vernacular. People that are going to be standing before him. And it's like maybe you see it on movies, the VIP line going into a club. Maybe that's a bad illustration for a church. A, a VIP line going into an art gallery. Okay, we'll do it that way. So they're in line, and you get up there, and the dude that's letting you in or not letting you in, and you walk up to that red rope, and you're like, dude, dude, come on, we know each other. We know some of the same people. See, I think that's what Jesus is kind of getting at there. People are going to look at him and say, Jesus, Jesus. I use your name on a regular basis. Listen to what they say. They're going to say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Now, Jesus isn't denying that that's not something that was said. But you remember old wicked King Saul? At one point, he's running around trying to kill David, and he falls in with the prophets, and King Saul himself begins to prophesy. So much so that people said, is King Saul now prophesying? King Saul was wicked to the core did everything against the Lord that he could do. Chased down David's chosen, I mean, God's chosen man, David, tried to kill him multiple times. And now Saul was prophesying. And that's what these people say, Lord, we, we had a huge TV ministry. We, we were doing stuff, man. We, we were the movers and shakers. We took and we bought a multiple seat auditorium and filled it every week. We, we preached in your name. We prophesied in your name. But that ain't where they stop. Listen there. We cast out demons in your name, Lord, Lord, Jesus. We had a deliverance ministry. We were, we were healing people of possession. We, we were, I used your name for lots of things. Look at what I've done. You hear, you hear that's what's being said here. How, how can I stand before you and, and not be perfectly right? Did you see what I did? And now I think we're getting at the heart of what's going on here. Not only did they prophesy, not only did they cast out demons, 
They did many mighty works, miracles, in his name. Lord, Lord, we, we, we performed miracles. We, we had a huge following. We, we, some of the most amazing things were done in your name. And you think about that, and you say, well, how can this be that he says these people aren't going to be in the kingdom when they actually did these things? See, that's the thing about the power in Jesus' name. We, we, have, com we have confused today power versus influence. Have you ever heard anybody say, he's a powerful man? Or, she's a very powerful woman. Have you heard somebody say that? And see, the world loves that. But that's not true. Nobody in this room has any power whatsoever. If so, turn a stone into bread. You don't have power, do you? You might have influence, but you don't have power. People with lots of money have lots of influence. They can buy and sell and they can control. People in politics that get positions, they have lots of influence. They have people on their side and, and they can work things out, but they can't manifest anything. But people today love power. And that's one of the reasons why Jesus reflects it this way. People are going to come to him and say, come on, we had power. Do you know how much money we made in our ministry? We couldn't have fooled your people with the amount of money they send us. It must be legit. And I've heard lots of people justify their ministries or their approach to life by how legit it was because people got on board. Well, is it the large crowd that's right, usually? It's not, is it? I heard it said or read it this week. All the people that are rushing to jump off the cliff marvel at the one running the other direction like they're an idiot. But isn't that the truth? Let's all go jump off the cliff. Look at that one moron. He's going the wrong way. He's the only one going to be saved when it's over with. And, and see, this is what Jesus is getting at. People marvel at power, but it's not real power. We have an enemy who God has allotted him power beyond ours, but it's all still controlled by God. God is the only one with power in the universe because all other powers got it from him. He's the true powerful one. But we sure do admire power, and we equate influence with power. And so there are lots of people that are going to come to Christ when it's all said and done. Said, so listen, we cast out demons in your name. We did miracles in your name. We prophesied in your name. We had power. We had clout. We had followers. What does Jesus say? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Or you workers of wickedness. I never knew you. Now think about that. Does that mean Jesus never heard of them? No. They didn't have a relationship. I have people come to me all the time. I mean, it's a regular basis. I'm not from Frankfurt, but I'm a pastor in Frankfurt. So you know how it is. Everybody in Frankfurt that's a pastor knows all the other pastors in Frankfurt. Not true. I don't know them. They don't know me. I've heard of a couple of them, but I don't know them. We don't have a bond. that We, we have a bond in that we serve the same God in the same kingdom. With the same work but other than that I don't really know them you ever been around somebody likes to name drop I say do you know so and so he and I are tight do you know him and I love to say I've heard the name but I, I don't know them personally and what I mean by that is we don't have a relationship and that's what Jesus is getting at here these people are going to come to him and say look at what we did in your name now is there power in the name of Christ are there miracles in the name of Christ? Even with false workers, even with people who aren't born again, the name of Jesus commands power. As a matter of fact, the Lord said several times in the Old Testament, I will put my name into that place. What did he do with Jesus? He put his name on Jesus. Jesus embodied the full whatever God, however you describe the, the, the holy differentness of God. Jesus was that name on earth, the name of God. God on earth. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved but Jesus. What's funny is that's not how he pronounced his name. But a rose of any other name, right? Still smells as sweet. The, the Yeshua would be the Aramaic version. 
Jesus would be the Greek version. But then the Germans come along and put a J in a language that never had a J. There's no J in Aramaic. There's no J in Hebrew. There's no J in Greek. But they saw that, and they put a J there. Uh, it's an iota, which looks like a little bitty J. And the Germans, they had a way to pronounce that little bitty J. J. You think that matters? It doesn't matter at all if we know who we're talking about. These people knew about Jesus. They didn't know him. And Jesus doesn't play that game. Jesus doesn't play name dropping. Now, his name has power, and there are lots of things that are done in his name because God chooses when and where with his power to do what he does. Some of you in here today were probably reached by maybe what the pastor could have considered the worst sermon ever or the little bless their heart soul winner that knocked on your door and you happened to open it and they were terrified. Now they got to tell somebody about Jesus. I mean, anybody ever been terrified trying to witness? Nobody in here? Well, let me ask another way. Anybody ever witness in here? Sometimes it's terrifying. And we're scared to death. But in the name of Jesus, there's power. Amen. How many of you have ever pled the blood or the name of Jesus because you were afraid? Your mama, your grandmama, maybe your granddaddy, you said you just plead the blood and them demons got to get out of there. We have faith in the name of Jesus, don't we? There's power in the name of Jesus. These people claim to know him, claim to have worked for him. Jesus said, I don't know who you are. But they wanted the power. Y'all remember in Acts chapter 8, a guy named Simon Magus, Simon the sorcerer, he got saved. He believed the message that they were preaching. And then he saw them lay hands on people, and they got the Holy Ghost, which means it was demonstrable in that day. What they saw, they knew something different just happened. They laid hands on them. They got the Holy Ghost. They spoke in tongues. Who knows what all else they did? It was the, the beginning movement of the church. And Simon Magnus said, now that's power. And he said to them, how much do I have to give you so that I can have that power? And the apostle said, your money die with you. Because you think that the power of God is for sale. He was way wrong, wasn't he? Way wrong. They were just trusting the Lord, laying on hands and praying, and God did what God did. Amen? People are infatuated with perceived power. God's not. Anything any servant of God accomplishes in their lifetime and their ministry is accomplished because of the power of God in their life. Amen? Without the power of God, we're nothing. Without the movement of the Spirit, we're nothing. We can stand and we can talk, and it may be interesting, but without the power of God, lives aren't changed. Hearts aren't changed. People don't get saved. They don't surrender their life to Christ. They don't dedicate their life to Christ. They don't repent from sins they're committing and start a new life aside from the true power of God and the conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit and the instruction that comes from the Word of God. And so Jesus said, on that day, there's going to be a lot of people. I bet he was kind of looking side-eyed over at the Pharisees. There's going to be a lot of people stand in front of me on that day. And say, Lord, Lord, you know me. And he's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You know what's interesting about that statement? It's found in Scripture. It's found in Psalm chapter 6, verse 8, or chapter 8, verse 6 is one or the other. I flip things like that sometimes. But David is lamenting over his sin. He was broken. You remember the sin with Bathsheba? He's lamenting that. He's broken over that. But while he did that, God judged him for that. And he was having a hard time in his life because of that sin. He took another man's wife. And then, so he wouldn't get caught because she was expecting, he had him killed. So David is an adulterer and a murderer. The man that's next to God's own heart. You know what's great about that story? Is we're all just like him. We don't want to admit it. But we're all just like him. We want to cover up things right? David lost the joy of his salvation. One of the psalms he prays, Lord, return to me the joy of my salvation. He had lost that. Why? Because he sinned against God. 
And it's the same for any of us in here today. When we start living in a life of sin, we lose the joy that comes with salvation. We start to feel guilty. We start to feel dirty. We don't have that, you know, we don't want to sing. We don't want to praise. You know, my praise is not worthy because I'm, I'm, I'm dirty that way. And, and people began to pick on David, and he began to get enemies because he had strayed from God, and the blessings in his life were being culled by God. David was having a bad time, and people were like blood in the water to sharks. The king, God's own man, has fallen. Now's the time for us to grab the power, right? Let's get the power. Let's knock David down while we can. And they were surrounding him. And what's David doing? He's crying out to God about the misery that he's in. And then he said, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Those trying to bring him down. They had just cause in their mind, but he was still God's man, no matter how far he had fallen. And you could tell he was God's man. Why? Because he repented. He missed the fellowship of God. Now, if you're in here today and you can live any kind of life you want to live and you don't miss the fellowship of God, I'd love to introduce you to Jesus because you don't know him. Because you can't continue to live like a hog and be a sheep, right? Sheep fall in the mud sometimes get dirty? Sure. But it's not their natural place. Neither is it a natural place for a born-again person of God to continually live in sin that God has talked to them about and not feel grief over their sin not feel grief over the loss of God's intimate presence but like Vance Havner said years ago a lot of times we get so used to working in the dark that we begin to be able to see in the dark and that's the way it can be in a Christian's life we get so used to not having close fellowship to God that we look back on our younger days when we were in the church and it was all good and it was all or the, when we first got saved and like Revelation talks about we were in love with the Lord and we were passionate for the Lord and it was an exciting time and then we look and said well what happened to that excitement you know I guess I just woke up I don't know it's just I don't have that same something's missing well God didn't change did he and that's what Jesus is talking about here there's so many people that are Kind of faking it. Standing in the garage hoping to become a Chevy. Doesn't happen that way, does it? You may know all the Christianese. Y'all know the Christianese, right? We pray with it a lot of times. We use it in churches. It's a language that nobody outside the church even understands. We love to use Christianese. I can remember when I was in middle school. It was called junior high at the time. And I took Spanish. And I can remember we and one of my friends that were taking Spanish for the first time. We were in Spanish probably three, four weeks. And we were walking, got off the bus, and we were walking. There were younger kids around. So we used every Spanish word we knew. They weren't incorrect sentences. They weren't conjugated right. We had no idea what they meant. But we were walking down the road talking to one another using just Spanish-sounding lingo. I had my kids convinced when they were little that I knew Spanish. You just got to put an O or an A on the end of every word. That was Spanish. And they believed dear old dad because dad the preacher wouldn't lie to them, right? It's so funny to watch them. Just go up and ask him. Say menuo. He'll, he'll know what you're talking about. <laughs> right? Evil. Evil sometimes bound in the heart, right? <laughs> we were using all those Spanish words and we had no idea what they even meant. Much less using them right. But you know what we believed? Those little children around us had no idea. Now, it wouldn't be the case in Cardinal Valley today because there's a lot of Latinas in the Cardinal Valley. They speak, I, I can't even follow the words. Every once in a while, I pick up a word I know. That's it. We weren't fooling anybody. Those kids weren't looking up to us. But there's people, Jesus said, that are doing that in their life. They don't have a relationship, but they want to talk like they do. They're posers. Well, the problem with posing as a Christian is God knows the truth. And on the day of judgment, no posers get in. I'd much rather see somebody broken in the middle, run down the aisle at the invitation and say, I thought I was saved, but I'm not sure that I am. Can you talk with me, Pastor? Way much. I'd prefer that over somebody who says, I don't really have any fruit, but I'm confident that, that I'm saved. I, I wouldn't want to go out that door if I didn't know for sure. Right? I mean, it's that big a deal, is it not? Jesus says there's no room for posers. 
And see, they all point to the, what they've done. Jesus said, that's not worth that. What does Titus say? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Right? By the washing of regeneration, by the renewal through the word. It's the word of God that changes things. On that day, he says, many are going to say to me, do we not prophesy in all these things? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. See, they were bragging about their works. What did Jesus say their works were? Lawlessness. Anything you bring Christ, anything you bring God, that's not salvation. If it's not receiving Christ as your Savior, he's not, he's not desirous of any work. Matter of fact, Isaiah puts it real plainly when Isaiah says, though our lives, our, our works, be as filthy as rags, right? All of our works of righteousness outside of Christ don't count. I've actually talked to people, and it's sad, kind of funny, though. We talk, talk to them about Christ, and they say, I've lived a pretty good life. I'm doing pretty good. I give to UNICEF. Um, I do this. I do that. I've got that I do. I've got that I do. You know, I, I, I read the Christmas story every Christmas at our house. I think I'm good. You're not, if that's what you're basing it on. I love the old fundamentalist question. If you were to stand before God at this very moment and he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would your answer be? It should be like the thief on the cross. He said I could be here. My faith is in him. My faith and trust is in what Jesus said. Not anything that I've done. It's not about what you've done. And that's what Jesus is explaining here. It's not about what you've done. Listen to what he goes on and says. He says it's real easy to figure out. And that's why I want to throw in these last verses. I know it's a little bit after 11. But if y'all listen quick, I'll speak quick and we'll still get out of here late. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a man who built his house upon the rock. Listen to what Jesus said. Which words? Which words is he talking about here? Sermon on the Mount. That's what he's talking about. He's closing his sermon. He said, everybody that hears my words and does them, what is it? Trusting God, surrendering to Christ, letting God move you to live in such a way. That's, that's the works. That's the only works he's looking for is to come to him in belief. Jesus said, don't you believe if you would just believe? If you can't believe the words I'm saying, believe if nothing else for the work's sake. See what I've done? Only God can do these things. People still don't want to believe in him. Pharisees still wanted to condemn him. They still wanted to curse him. They said stupid things like, has anything good ever come out of Nazareth? That, that, was, their, that was their theology for the day. Y'all look it up. Is there any prophets in Nazareth? No, I don't think so. Well, you know, he hangs out with harlots, and he hangs out with publicans, and he hangs, he hangs out with sinners. Can he be a good person? See, that's how they judged him in that day. Jesus said, it's real simple. You base your life on me or you're building a house on sand. She said, listen, the, the one who hears the words, the wise man builds his house upon the rock. Now, the rock there is not Jesus, but that, that's good preaching. The rock here is the, the solid teaching that he's been giving them. You build your life upon the teaching. You, you listen to what I say. You, you come to Christ as your Savior. That's, that's the building on the rock. But some people don't need him, right? I'll get to heaven on my own. I do pretty good stuff. I've never really been mad. I've never really killed anybody. I love that line because Jesus says, we ever hated anybody? Then you're guilty. Jesus said, the wise person listens to my words. The rain fell, the floods came, and the wind blew. But the house did not fall. Why? It's built upon the words of Jesus. It's built upon the teachings of Jesus. He's using this illustration to talk about the Sermon on the Mount. The person who hears what I've been saying. How important do you think Sermon on the Mount is? Jesus said, if you listen to my words and then bring them into your life, you're like building your house upon the rock. It's going to stand no matter the troubles in life, no matter the struggles that you have. When you build your house upon the teachings of Christ, you can make it through anything. But have you ever seen a Christian lose it? Because they got a hiccup in life. That's because they didn't have their house built right. 
Again, standing in a garage doesn't make you a car. Coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. Singing those songs doesn't make you a Christian. And though we like you to put money in an offering plate because it helps us keep going, they won't make you a Christian either. You can't buy your way into heaven. But those that hear Christ love your enemies. You don't know my enemies. Bless those that persecute you. I ain't doing that. I'm no weakling. I'm stronger than that. I'm not blessing those that persecute me. It's a choice then, isn't it? Jesus said if you disregard his teachings, it's like building a house on sand. Looks good though, doesn't it? The way Jesus tells the story, you can't tell the difference between a house on the rock and a house on the sand. It looks the same. How do you know the difference? In the time of testing. In the time of testing, you can see the difference. Does it crumble or does it stand? I love to hear a Christian say, you know, I'm going through the worst time of my life. But I've got a peace that I cannot explain to you. I'm like, that's what Paul said. A peace that passeth all understanding. You can't wrap your brain about how at peace you are and you're in the middle of this situation. You know why? Because that was built upon the rock of God's Word. It's the Holy Spirit moving in us. And, and Jesus says, listen, James says it plainly. If you'll draw nigh to God, what will God do? Draw nigh to you. Do you notice the first step is you drawing nigh? Turn in repentance. Step towards him in faith. Decide you're going to live your life according to the scripture, the word. It, all those things. You say, Lord, I, I'm really struggling, but I, but I want to try. I'm going to, I'm going to begin serving you in this way. And God says, that sounds good. I'll meet you there and I'll help you. That's what it's about. That's the teaching. Knowing Christ as your Savior equals serving him as your Lord. You can't have one, not the other. It's not like the little cards you get in Monopoly where you get to pass go. You're not going to stand before Jesus one day and say, I'm glad you asked that question, Lord. Here's my get out of hell free card. Jesus will say, I didn't issue any of those. You know me or you don't know me. So much so that there are people Jesus describes that claim to know him, but they don't know him. Their proof is their works. And Jesus says the proof is is the fruit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. You know those in Galatians 5? That's fruit of the Spirit. If the Spirit's not in you, you're not producing that fruit. That's a hard test. Love, love, joy. People say, I'd have joy, but it's an election year. Okay. Peace, I'd have peace, but you don't know my kids, right? I mean, long-suffering. I, Lord, I'd, I want to be Lord-suffering, but you don't know my daddy. He was as impatient a man as there ever was. I think Jesus would say, you need a new daddy. Try me on. See, that's the fruit of the Spirit. And it's evident in a true believer's, a true disciple's life. Do we struggle with those? Oh, yeah. Sometimes we fail miserably, right? But we don't like to stay there. We want to get back to the fellowship of the Lord. If you can stay there, you may want to do a checkup on your salvation. Do you know him? Better yet, does he know you? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. They know me. So that's what I love about church because we gather the church. The word church, ecclesia, means a gathering of believers. And you may be sitting in here today and you're not a believer. You're not a born-again person. You're sitting in here, but you're not part of the church because the church is the bride of Christ. And only those that are washed in the blood, I love that saying, right? Washed in the blood. Those that are part of his family are in the church. We may have your name on a roll. doesn't mean a thing. Nowhere did God say, thou shalt make a roll. And no matter how faithful they are, no matter how often they come, no matter how, where they live, they shall go to heaven. It doesn't say that. 
But Jesus says, if you've been washed in my blood and I know you, he's going to welcome us into his home and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Right? Faithful. To what? What he's given us to be faithful to. Amen? Tough, tough teaching. Blew their mind. You see how it ends? They were astonished. Because he acted like he knew what he was talking about. I love it when people say, Jesus never really claimed to be Lord or God. <laughs> he just said he's the judge of the entire world. Who else could that be? Anyway, let's have, let's have a word of prayer and we'll close. I'd like to have an invitation to do two today simply because well, there's been a presentation of the gospel and maybe a challenge to our beliefs and views. So let's pray. Father, right now we, we bow before you. Father, I pray that the words that I've said that are effective that come from you, I pray that those will be remembered and that they will have effect in our lives. Father, I pray that we're open to the movement of the Spirit. Father, if there's business that we need to do with you, we can sit right here, right now, where we're doing, and we can do business with you. But, Father, is anybody in here that has questions about their salvation? Father, they have questions about eternal security. If they, have, they have questions about even more teaching on this passage that Jesus said. Father, I pray that you'll give them the strength and the courage, Father, to step out and come talk to me about that. And we'll set up a time where we can meet. Father, I pray that you will have your will and your way with your people today. Convict us, guide us, direct us. And we know that you will because you love us with all of your heart. And we thank you for your sacrifice that allows us to be part of your household. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. What song are we going to sing?